now, that brings us to this new section, beginning of chapter 30. And I think the first three chapters here, well, 30 and 31, 32 and 33, are all one tremendous message that you have here. And we'll move into this. We have in this particular section here, by the way, and I think it's a very wonderful section now that we've come to, but it comes out of the darkest days that Israel ever had. These days were dark indeed. And out of this now, you're going to hear a wonderful message from Jeremiah. Never got so dark, but what he didn't have a message of encouragement. And look where they are. The army of Nebuchadnezzar now is outside the city walls, and he means business. This time he'll destroy the city and burn the temple. The prophet here has been arrested, and he's been shut up in the courtyard. I didn't tell you that as we went along. He is in jail. And seven years have passed since this man Jeremiah had his conflict with the false prophets. Now, events have moved along rather quietly, but actually every day reveals the accuracy of Jeremiah's message. And Hananiah, he'd said that within two years the power of Babylon would be broken. Seven years have gone by, and there's Nebuchadnezzar outside the city wall, and he's not about to be broken. He's about to break Jerusalem. The vessels of the Lord's house now are not going to be restored to the temple. Jeconiah will not be returned back to the city. And things now have gone from bad to worse, and they're out of the frying pan into the fire, and the life of the nation has gone down. And Jerusalem was already under the shadow of Babylon. And God's prophet was held captive by that rebellious spirit of a sinning nation who refused to hear the word of the Lord. Now, can any hour be darker? Can any circumstances be more calculated to fill the heart with despair? Well, it was at this time that the prophetic note of the prophet went all the way from the basement up to the top of the Empire State Building. He now is able to not sing low bass, but he's going to be able to sing soprano, if you please. He's going to reach the heights now, and he's going to talk about it first. But all the way through darkness into light, the night cometh, but also the morning is coming. Now he opens chapter 30. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. Now, he's writing his prophecy. After all, he's in jail. He won't be in the pulpit for Sunday morning. Verse 3 now. For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. And these are the words that the Lord spoke concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus saith the Lord, we've heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. And believe me, they had heard that from Jeremiah, that there'd be no peace. But the false prophets had said peace, and there was none. He says, Now ask ye now, and see whether a man doth travail with child? Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins, as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into sadness, paleness. Now he sees not only that great day coming, but the day of the Lord is coming. That the other prophets, including Isaiah, had said it's a day of darkness, and not light. Well, they go through the night into the brightness of the day. In other words, they go through the great tribulation and listen to him in verse 7. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. God said, there's coming a day that you think it's bad now. You haven't seen anything yet. 
wait until that great tribulation begins. Verse 9, "...but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them." And out of that time of awful trouble, they're going to return to the land, and David will be raised from the dead when they enter the kingdom and will reign over these people. Now, verse 18, will you notice it? Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring again the captivity of Jacob's tents and have mercy on his dwelling places, and the city shall be builded upon her own heap, and the palace shall remain after the manner thereof. Now, when will this take place? Way down at verse 24, he says, "...the fierce anger of the Lord shall not return until he have done it, and until he have performed the intents of his heart in the latter days, ye shall consider it." In other words, this is something way down in the future. Now, friends, here in Jeremiah, we have come to a section that is bright indeed, and it is very encouraging. We have seen up to this point nothing in the world but judgment. But here from chapter 30 through 33, we have a contrast to the messages that we've had up to this point. Now, these chapters 30, 31, 32, 33, we have four chapters here now that constitute one song, or as Hengstenberg put it, here you have the triumphal hymn of Israel's salvation. And this was the darkest moment in the history of the nation. Now, as we indicated before, Zedekiah was reigning. He would correspond to Ahab and Jezebel in the northern kingdom. But, of course, they had long since disappeared, and the kingdom had already been taken into captivity. And these were indeed dark days, because outside the walls of Jerusalem was Nebuchadnezzar's army again, and this time he will burn the city and the temple, and the false prophets had been proven false. Hananiah said in two years, well, Babylon would be broken and the vessels of the Lord's house would be returned. Well, that was a false prophecy because Hanani is dead, and that was about seven years before that. Now, here's Nebuchadnezzar, and it certainly passed the two years, and he's very much alive. He's too much alive for these people. And now, here comes the message of encouragement. Now, we went through chapter 30 last time, and it opens as the day of the Lord opens in all the prophets. It opens with the great tribulation period, and it's called here in chapter 30, verse 7, the time of Jacob's trouble. But he moves from that. You see that they are in great trouble directly and definitely at this time. But now he moves beyond that to the time of Jacob's trouble, but beyond that, there is coming the restoration, and the land will be restored to them, and they'll be brought back into that land. With that kind of a background, let's begin now with chapter 31. And in chapter 31, we have, I've labeled it the I will chapter. I will occurs 15 times, and the one who says that it's none other than God. God says, fifteen times I will. And it's what he's going to do. Now, will you notice? Verse 1, chapter 31 of Jeremiah. At the same time, saith the Lord, will I, and that's the same as I will, will I be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Now, that has not come. That part has not been fulfilled Yet, the present return of Israel to that land cannot be interpreted at all as being the fulfillment of it, because they have not returned to God. I'm told, and I have an article that comes from that land, and I don't care to identify the folk that have sent it, because I wouldn't want them to get in trouble. 
But there's real persecution of Christians that go on in that land today. They talk about, of course, religious freedom. Well, actually, they don't quite have it over there. And it's because of the fact that they have not really returned to the Lord. Now, verse 2, Thus saith the Lord, The people which were left of the sword found grace in the wilderness, even Israel, when I went to cause him to rest. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Now listen to this, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Now we come to the explanation. We come to the reason that God is going to restore them back to that land. I believe with all my heart that God intends to restore the nation Israel to that land in his own time and in his own plan and in his own purpose. And the basis for it is explained right here. I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Now, there are many favorite statements in the Word of God, but I suppose that this one here is probably the most quoted of any with the exception of John 3.16. I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Now, there are those today that raise the question, of course, well, how can God love these people? And that's a good question, by the way. How can God love the nation Israel the way that actually they're doing over in that land today? Well, may I say to you, why not widen that question out just a little and ask it like this, how can God love us today? Because he says, God so loved the world. Not only these people, but God loves the world, and he loves you and me. And friends, you're not going to find a satisfactory answer to that in ourselves for the very simple reason that it's very easy to point your finger at those people, and some do. And I'd like to say this to any anti-Semite that's listening to me right now. May I say to you, you can criticize these people all you want to. God says, I've loved thee with an everlasting love. And I want to say to you, what are you going to do with that? God says that. What are you going to do with it? Now, instead of pointing your finger at these people, why don't you turn it around and point it to yourself today? In God's sight, you are as great a sinner as anyone on the outside. And it took the death of Christ to provide a redemption for you and me. And don't limit this to just a few people today and say, how can God love them? Well, my friend, how can God love me? How can God love you today? And we are amazed at it. Faber put it in a song that goes like this. I'm not going to sing it, understand. How thou canst think so well of us, yet be the God thou art, is darkness to my intellect, but sunshine to my heart. Well, there are two words here, and I want to say a word about them before I pass on. And the first word I want to say concerns the first word, everlasting. I know very little about that. I'm sorry to have to say it, but... That's a word that, when you use it, I'm not sure you've told me everything. All I know is, is like that little boy I told you about, his answer was, when I asked him about how long is everlasting, or how long is the word never, and he says, I reckon it's a pretty long time. And that's all I can say about everlasting. It's a pretty long time. And then love, what is that, by the way? Well, the explanation is that God loves us. And will you hear me very carefully now? Because I'm not sure that this answer satisfies me or not. But this is the best I can do until some other comes along. God loves you and me, not because he sees anything in us, but because of who he is. 
and because he finds the explanation in himself. And the apostle put it like this, Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. Now, that's love. And Kramer made this comment on that text. He says, The love of God toward us comes from love and has no other cause above or beside itself, but it's in God, and it remains in God, so that Christ, who is God, is its center. He hath love, he hath love, and he loves you, and he loves me, and I can't tell you why, my friend. I still can't tell you why. And let me just quote Faber again. Yet thou dost think so well of us, because of what thou art, thy love illumines our intellect, yet fills with fear our heart. I'm overwhelmed by the love of God. I want to say this, that I'm so overwhelmed with it, that, and it's so wonderful, I'm afraid he might change his mind tomorrow about this thing, and if he does, I'm a goner, <laughs> and you are too. But he says it's everlasting, and that's a pretty long time. So it makes this quite wonderful here. And if you want to know why God is going to restore these people back to the land, and I can't refrain from saying this. I must say it. I have a great many amillennialist friends that believe God is through with the nation Israel. May I say to you, if he's through with them, he's through with you, and he's through with me. But he says, I've loved you with an everlasting love, and that's the reason he's not through with them. And I don't care what you think about them. And it doesn't make any difference what I think about them. God is not through with them. Now we're prepared to hear what he's going to say about these people. I drop down to verse 8. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coasts of the earth. And with them the blind and the lame, the woman with child and her that travaileth with child together, a great company shall return thither. Now, you would think that you could leave the blind and the lame aside, and if it's going to be a big undertaking to bring them, just bring the best ones, the best physical specimens. God says, nothing of the kind. I'm bringing them all. Now, he goes on, verse 9, "...they shall come with weeping and with supplications will I lead them." I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Now, God never said that of any individual Israelite. It's Moses, my servant. He never said it of David. It's David, my servant. But the whole nation, when he speaks of them as a corporate body, God says, I'm a father to Israel, to the nation, but not to individual Israelites. Now, verse 10, Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. And I want to say to you today that I'm delighted to be able to be on radio stations actually, that'll go around the world, and I'm able to say today what God says. I want the isles of the earth to hear it, and I want all mankind to hear it, that I scattered Israel. It was a judgment upon them, but I've loved them with an everlasting love, and I'm going to bring them back to that land. He judged them, but he loved them, and he'll bring them to that land. That is what you'd call the bittersweet of this passage here. All through here you have the note of joy, but you also have a note of sorrow. There is a Chinese dish called sweet sour. And that's what this passage is. You have the sweet and you have the sour. God says, I'm going to keep him. And I'm going to keep him like a shepherd doth his flock. And a shepherd really watches over his flock. Now, how will he do it? Verse 11, For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and ransom him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Now, God is not through saying what he will do. Verse 13, Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, 
both young men and old together, for I will turn their mourning into joy, and I will comfort them, and I will make them rejoice from their sorrow, and I will satiate or satisfy the soul of the priests with fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, saith the Lord." And I don't know, I feel like saying hallelujah and throw my hat in the air. This is what God says he's going to do for them. And let's let him say it, because that's what he wants to do. Now, their immediate condition is tragic. They rebelled against God. They are backsliding. Verse 22, "...how long wilt thou go about, O thou backsliding daughter? For the Lord hath created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall compass a man." Now, there are those that believe that this verse here refers to the virgin birth of Jesus, and I see no reason to rule that out. Now, here, beginning with verse 31, we have God's covenant, a new covenant that he intends to make with Israel, all 12 tribes, and if you think 10 of them are lost, God doesn't. He's going to make it with all 12 tribes. And this is going to be different from the covenant given to Moses at Mount Sinai. And the grand distinction is that this covenant will be engraved upon their hearts and not upon cold tables of stone. Their sins will be forgiven. This covenant will never be changed or abrogated. Will you listen? Verse 31, "...behold, the days come, saith the Lord." that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord." I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. That's very clear-cut language. Verse 34, And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord." For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. God says that's in the past, and it's been put in the past. And now, notice how God confirms it. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. God says that if you can pull the moon out, we're doing a little something with it. The last trip up, they brought down 200 pounds of rock, and if they keep that up, a few million years, they'll have it all moved from up there, and there won't be any up there. But I don't think they're going to do it because God says that this is going to be an everlasting covenant that he makes with them. Now, when we come to chapter 32 here, and it's another very wonderful chapter, Jeremiah's in prison. And even though he's in prison, he buys real estate. Now, we are told here, and the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah which was the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar. You see how he pinpoints this now? This is in the 10th year of Zedekiah. This is the year that Nebuchadnezzar breached the walls of Jerusalem and destroyed it. For then the king of Babylon's army besieged Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the prison, which was in the king of Judah's house. It's a dark day, you see. Here, this man, Jeremiah, is in prison, and Nebuchadnezzar's about ready to get into the city and destroy it. Now, this man, Jeremiah, he had a relative by the name of Hanamiel, 
And verse 7, Behold, Hannah Meal, the son of Shalem, thine uncle, shall come unto thee, saying, Buy thee my field that is an Anathoth, for the right of redemption is thine to buy it. And the interesting thing is, verse 9, he says, And I bought the field. Now, this was the time to sell real estate. And I have a notion that the real estate dealers in Jerusalem and in that surrounding country were really dumping all the real estate they possibly could. But this man, Jeremiah, bought it. Now, at the darkest time, he buys real estate. Why does he do it? To let these people know that he believes they're going to return back to that land, which they did return back to that land. And he bought this real estate. I think this is a remarkable passage of Scripture. And then you have the prayer of Jeremiah, beginning here in verse 16. He says, "...now when I delivered the evidence of the purchase under Baruch the son of Neriah, I prayed unto the Lord, saying, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven, the earth, by thy great power stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee." Now, he's got a question that's too hard for him, and he's bringing it to the Lord. Thou showest loving kindness unto thousands, recompense the iniquity of fathers unto the bosom of their children after them. The great, the mighty God, the Lord of hosts is his name. Great in counsel and mighty. Now, he says, and thou hast brought forth thy people, verse 21, now out of Israel, out of the land of Egypt, with signs, wonders, strong arm. Verse 22, "...and hast given them this land which thou didst swear to their fathers." Verse 23, "...and they came in and possessed it." Verse 24, "...behold the mounts, they are come into the city to take it, and the city is given into the hand of the Chaldeans that fight against it." Verse 25, "...and thou hast said unto me, O Lord God, buy thee the field for money, and take witnesses, for the city is given into the hand of the Chaldeans." And this man now has a question, and I mean a real question. And Jeremiah's no hypocrite. You know, there are a lot of Christians today that are hypocritical in their actions. You know, something comes to them, and they become very pious, and they say, Oh, I just trust the Lord, and the Lord has let this come, and I accept it. And they don't accept it. They cry out to him, and they complain about it, you see. And they ask him why. Now, my friend, there's nothing wrong in asking why. Just don't try to cover up and say how pious you are. If you have a doubt or a question, go talk to the Lord about it. He wants you to. Don't give this front today that so many pious people do. Oh, I've committed this to the Lord. You haven't committed it to the Lord. You say, oh, I trust him. You don't trust him. You've got question marks as high as the moon, and you have no answer. Oh, my friend, God says now, and he comes in and speaks to this man, Jeremiah, and he says to him, Jeremiah, you can trust me. I will bring these people back to this land. I'm carrying forth my purpose in the world. Oh, my friend, to be able to go to God and then have God encourage our hearts. Let him know how you feel. Now, in chapter 33, we have God confirming and reaffirming the covenant that he made with David, and that there is a day coming when he will restore them to the land, and they will be restored to fellowship with God. Now, I'm reading chapter 33, verse 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the second time, while he was yet shut up in the court of the prison. He's still in jail, you see, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the maker thereof, the Lord that formed it to establish it, the Lord is his name. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things, which thou knowest not. Now, I've been in testimony meetings and other meetings where verses of Scripture have been given, and this is a verse that occurs, I would say, very frequently, and it's one that is a wonderful verse. 
Call unto me, and I'll answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Well, that's fine that we quote that, maybe at times like that, but it becomes quite meaningless in my book unless you put it back where it belongs. And that's right here in the 33rd chapter. You will recall last time we saw the man, he was still in prison. He bought a piece of real estate because God told him to. He acted by faith, and he bought the real estate. But he had a great many questions in his mind. Why was God letting this happen to his people? Why was God permitting this and letting them go into captivity? Now, he had his moments of doubt. And I think, frankly, it's an example of a great faith when you have these moments. Now, somebody's going to say, well, how can that be an example of great faith? Well, my friend, if you are walking with God and you're in fellowship with him, he is so wonderful and he does so many wonderful things that there are times when you and I won't understand what he's doing. (laughs) And there are times when God does something and our question is bound to be, well, why are you doing this? Why do you permit this? Don't you have questions like that? Well, I've got questions like that. I remember one evening going to the hospital to see my wife and our firstborn baby. (laughs) And the nurse said to me, said, the doctor wants to speak to you. The nurse looked very serious. And the doctor said to me, he says, the little baby died. (laughs) And I went in to my wife because he hadn't told her. And then we went in and we told her. And we wept, and I walked out, and I never shall forget, there at the hospital there's a sort of a porch out, open air, and this was summertime. And I walked out on that, and I looked up toward the heavens and the stars, and I had a question. And you know what that question was? Why? And you want to know something? I still look up and ask that question. May I say to you that, I've learned now, though, to put my hand in his and just keep walking in the dark. And many times I talk this over with him, and I tell him about my doubts and that I trust him, though. And you see, faith has its doubts. Faith just won't understand everything. And I do know this, that the day is coming when he's going to explain it to me. And It's going to be a satisfactory explanation, but right now I'm still saying why. And I don't think it's wrong. I really don't. I think there's something wrong when, if I went out and put up a front and said, Oh, I trust the Lord and everything's going to be all right and I've accepted it and I'm walking now with him and hallelujah. Well, friends, just in that way, I walk with him by faith, but... I'm a little child that says to him, why do you do this? And there are times that there are a lot of questions I don't have the answer for. And I'm thankful Jeremiah was that kind of a man. And I find there are other men in the Scripture that have been the same way. We'll get to another prophet by the name of Habakkuk. And Habakkuk, he had a lot of questions. In fact, his book is just a great big why. And there are other prophets that had that. Jonah had a few questions to ask the Lord. And my friend, it's not a revelation of lack of faith. It's just a revelation of hypocrisy when we put up a front. And I think God wants us to be honest above everything else. And because we are, I think he'll enable us to beat our music out. Now, the word of the Lord came unto him, and he's in prison. And God says to him in prison, Now, he says, Jeremiah, you call on me. (laughs) It's all right. I'll answer you. And I'm going to show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. You remember, Jeremiah started off by saying to the Lord, well, there's nothing impossible with you. And since there's nothing, why don't you do it another way? He says, I'll do it my way, but you can trust me. You call upon me, and I'll show you a few things. And I want to say this, that 
we're living in a world where God has been ruled out pretty much. But very frankly, I seem to see him moving very definitely. I dare not say to you what I believe that he's done in this nation today. I think God's been doing a little judging. I think God is still moving in the affairs of men today, though they may not acknowledge him. And that's exactly what you have here in this particular section or the next one that we're coming to. Now, I want to take up this marvelous, wonderful passage of Scripture here in the 33rd chapter, and it begins in the 14th verse. And I hope that you will turn down. Now, this is God's covenant with David, and it's back in Second Samuel the seventh chapter, God made a covenant with David. that would be one to sit on his throne. That became the theme song of every prophet. In fact, they all sound like a stuck record. They are like that, and they all go back to that, and they all rest on that. Now, listen to Jeremiah. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised unto the house of Israel, to the house of Judah, in those days. Now, what days is that? Well, it's in that day that's coming, the day of the Lord. And at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David. And he hasn't had a righteous branch so far, except one. And that is the one that was born in Bethlehem. And he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. We haven't had any ruler like that yet. In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah said Kenu, the Lord our righteousness. And if we have any, It's Christ today. For thus saith the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. And by the way, where do you think that man is today? There's not an Israelite on top side of the earth could make the claim to David's throne. But because the one that has that claim is sitting at God's right hand, because the psalmist said, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. And that's what God's busy doing today. He's calling out a people to his name and getting things ready to put his son on the throne of this universe. Verse 19, now, I'm reading again. And the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, if ye can break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the night, and that there should not be day and night in their season, then may also my covenant be broken with David my servant, that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne, and with the Levites, the priests, my ministers, as the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured. So will I multiply the seed of David my servant and the Levites that minister unto me." Now, at this particular time, Zedekiah is on the throne. He is as corrupt as any man ever was. Nebuchadnezzar will put out his eyes, take him into captivity. That'll be the subject of this next chapter. And you would think that this would end the line of David. It would end the line of any other nation, I can assure you that. The king of Babylon, I don't think anybody's around to claim that throne today. There's no one around to take Alexander the Great's place, and there's no Pharaoh around in Egypt today. But there's one in David's line that can make that claim. And God says that he intends to put him on the throne of this universe someday. This is a great prophecy, by the way, and one that's very difficult to ignore and to try to spiritualize it. I think God means exactly what he says. Now, when we come here to chapter 34, Zedekiah's captivity now is foretold. And I begin reading it, verse 1 of chapter 34. The word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, 
when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army, and all the kingdoms of the earth of his dominion, and all the people fought against Jerusalem and against all the cities thereof, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Go and speak to Zedekiah, king of Judah, and tell him, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire, and thou shalt not escape out of his hand, but shall surely be taken and delivered into his hand, and thine eyes shall behold the eyes of the king of Babylon, and he shall speak with thee mouth to mouth, and thou shalt go to Babylon. Yet hear the word of the Lord, O Zedekiah king of Judah, Thus saith the Lord to thee, Thou shalt not die by the sword, but thou shalt die in peace. And with the burnings of thy father, the former kings which were before thee, so shall they burn odors for thee. And they will lament thee, saying, Ah, Lord, I have pronounced the word, saith the Lord. Then Jeremiah the prophet spake all these words unto Zedekiah king of Judah in Jerusalem, When the king of Babylon's army fought against Jerusalem and against all the cities of Judah that were left, against Lachish and against Azekah, for these defense cities remained of the cities of Judah. Now, he went on because Zedekiah attempted to make a decree and make a covenant to give liberty to the people. Verse 8, this is the word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord. After that, the king Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people which were at Jerusalem to proclaim liberty unto them. Now, he didn't make good that covenant. In verse 16, we read, "...but ye turn," that is, this man Zedekiah, and those associated with him, "...but ye turned and polluted my name," or you profane my name." and caused every man his servant, every man his handmaid, whom he'd set at liberty at their pleasure to return, and brought them into subjection to be unto you for servants and for handmaid. You see, the life of the child of God is what the world will always look at. Now, this man, Zedekiah, pretended to bring liberty, and that's the way that uh, ruler of Israel could demonstrate to the world he was different, that he served the living and true God, that he'd grant liberty to the people. Now, he doesn't make good. And that not only brings the king himself into disrepute, but it profanes the name of God. And I think God's name today and God's word is hurt more by those who profess to know him than by all the godless professors that we've got in our colleges today. I actually believe that those who name the name of Christ by their lives, they hurt the cause of Christ more than those that are outside. You have polluted my name, God says. You profane my name. Now, he says in verse 17, Therefore thus saith the Lord, Ye have not hearkened unto me, in proclaiming liberty, every one to his brother and every man to his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim liberty for you, saith the Lord, to the sword, to the pestilence, and to famine. And I will make you to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. And I will give the men that have transgressed my covenant, which have not performed the words of the covenant which they had made before me, when they cut the calf in twain and passed between the parts thereof. That's the way men made a contract in that day. They took a sacrifice, cut it in half, put half of the animal on one side, half on the other. Then they went between and joined hands, and that was like going before a notary. That's what Abraham did, you remember. God told him to get the sacrifices ready, and God made a covenant with him. Now, we find a group, and this is always the remnant, In chapter 35, the Rechabites, they are part of the remnant, and they are different than any others. And God has given this to us to let you know, as he always says, there's always been a remnant, and that he would never leave the world without a witness. God, even in the darkest time of the history of the world that's yet future, in the Great Tribulation, when 144,000 have had to go 
undercover. They have had to go underground. There will be two witnesses that are going to stand for God, because God just going to have it that way, even in the time when Satan is permitted to run the whole show. At that time, God says, I'll still keep two witnesses around, and they will be inviolate, and you can't touch them until their mission has been accomplished. Now, the Rechabites, and Jeremiah was told here to go. I'm reading verse 1 of chapter 35. The word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, Go unto the house of the Rechabites, and speak unto them, and bring them into the house of the Lord, into one of the chambers, and give them wine to drink. In other words, they are brought in, actually, for the celebration of the Passover. They are still true to God. Who are they? Verse 16, Because the sons of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, have performed the commandment of their fathers which he commanded them, but this people hath not hearkened unto me. And God made a distinction, you see, between the remnant and the nation that had departed from him. This is given to us, I think, just to let us know that. Now I come to chapter 36, and we see here the attitude of Jehoiakim toward the Word of God. This man, Jeremiah, sends a message to him. Verse 1 of chapter 36, "...it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a roll of a book, write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel, against Judah, and against all the nations from the day I spake unto thee, from the days of Josiah, even unto this day. Well, he sends it, and Baruch took the message over, verse 18. Then Baruch answered them. He pronounced all these words into me with his mouth, and I wrote them with ink in the book. And they brought it now to the king. Verse 22, Now the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month. There was a fire on the hearth burning before him. came to pass that when Jehudi had read three or four leaves, he cut it with a pen knife, cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. That's what he thought of the Word of God. Old Jehoiakim, why, he took the Word of God, he just flung it in the fire. He didn't care for it, he didn't accept it, didn't believe it. I'm not impressed that the Bible is still the bestseller. Yes, but who's reading it? Remember that little jingle. It says, Ma, I found an old dusty thing high upon the shelf. Just look. Why, that's a Bible, Tommy dear. Be careful, that's God's book. God's book, the young one said. Then, Ma, before we lose it, we'd better send it back to God, because you know we never use it. The Bible today is not being read. And we've attempted to start something that's pretty hard to get going. However, we've been amazed at the response to it. Yet I recognize that today that the multitude of people are like Jehoiakim. As far as they're concerned, they just well put it in the fire. They pay no attention to it. Verse 24, "...yet they were not afraid, nor rent their garments, neither the king." Now, if you think God's going to stop here, you're wrong. God said to Jeremiah, I want you to write it over again and send it to him. Verse 28, "...take thee again another roll, write in it all the former words that were in the first roll, which Jehoiakim the king of Judah hath burned." Verse 30, "...therefore thus saith the Lord of Jehoiakim king of Judah, he shall have none to sit upon the throne of David, and his dead body shall be cast out in the day to the heat, and in the night to the frost." And that's exactly what happened to him. And he has none to sit on the throne of David today. The Lord Jesus did not come in that line. Joseph was in that line. Mary was not. She came from Nathan, another son of David. And from her, he got the blood title to the throne. And from Joseph, the legal title. But none in the line of Jehoiakim was to sit on the throne. Now we have come here to the 37th chapter of Jeremiah. And actually, we have now moved into a new section of the book. The emphasis from now on is historical. 
It's almost like Jeremiah is saying now, I told you so. But he's too much involved. He is crushed. He is broken by the message that he's had to give and now to see it fulfilled. And the city that he loved and the people he loved and the nation he loved going now into captivity and the city destroyed. So that this is not, I told you so, from Jeremiah, but it's the heartbreak of a man who was involved in this program of God, and he is revealing God. He's God's witness. And if you want to know how God feels about all of this, look at the tears streaming down the eyes of Jeremiah. And we need to recognize that over 30 years of this man's ministry has gone by. We saw him as a young man, about 20 years of age, as he began his ministry as a young priest who was called to be a prophet of God. And he was a prophet of God. Now he's in prison, and he's not only in prison, but outside the walls of Jerusalem, there's the army of the king of Babylon. And they have been there now in a long siege of 18 months. And Jeremiah doesn't go into a great deal of detail here, but actually, if you go back to the second book of Kings and the second book of Chronicles, and you would find a record of it. In fact, the last chapter of Jeremiah, the 52nd chapter, covers that, and I probably will be referring to that in this section that we're in. Now we have here the fall of Jerusalem in chapters 37, 38, and 39. And we want to cover these chapters here. In chapter 37, we see this man now put into prison. And he was put into prison because of the fact that he had said to the king that he was not to make an alliance with Pharaoh and that he was to surrender to Babylon. And he almost did the very opposite of what God had told him to do. And this was Zedekiah. We are now at the very door of the captivity of the nation. Verse 11, and I dropped down to read that, "...it came to pass that when the army of the Chaldeans was broken up from Jerusalem for fear of Pharaoh's army, then Jeremiah went forth out of Jerusalem to go into the land of Benjamin." to separate himself thence in the midst of the people. Now, what had happened was this, that Nebuchadnezzar was coming down for the third, and actually for him the last time, he was going to destroy Jerusalem. Before, he'd just taken a certain number of the people captive and had put someone on the throne there. In fact, he had put Zedekiah on the throne. And Zedekiah was his vassal, but... He certainly wanted to get out from and under the king of Babylon, and he made an overture to Pharaoh in Egypt, and Pharaoh in Egypt decided to come up and try to relieve the king. And, of course, what he would do, he just moved the southern kingdom of Judah under the rule of Egypt. The thing was that the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, came up, and Nebuchadnezzar then his commanders that were there, they turned, and instead of besieging the city, they went after Pharaoh and actually drove him back. And Israel made a big mistake in this. And now we find that it looks at this point as if Jeremiah might be wrong. And so Jeremiah, while the city is being relieved, he comes out of the city to go up to his hometown of Anathoth, and when he does, will you notice what we're told, verse 12, Then Jeremiah went forth out of Jerusalem to go into the land of Benjamin to separate himself thence in the midst of the people. And when he was in the gate of Benjamin, a captain of the ward was there, whose name was Arijah, the son of Shalemiah, the son of Hananiah. And he took Jeremiah the prophet, saying, Thou fallest away to the Chaldeans. Now they make an accusation against Jeremiah that he's going over to the enemy. 
Verse 14, Then said Jeremiah, It's false. I fall not away to the Chaldeans, but he hearkened not to him. So Elijah took Jeremiah and brought him to the princes. Wherefore the princes were wroth with Jeremiah and smote him, put him in prison in the house of Jonathan the scribe, for they had made that the prison. And he's here actually in the court of the prison, and that's where they were keeping him now. And this, by the way, is the fourth time. It's the fourth time that poor Jeremiah's been arrested and thrown in prison. And there's one more coming up, by the way. Now, here in chapter 38, this man is still in prison, Jeremiah is. And the thing that he does, he sends from prison a message to Zedekiah to obey God at this time, because Outside is the army, and the army is going to destroy the city. Now, I want to read here, beginning with verse 17 of chapter 38. Then said Jeremiah unto Zedekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, If thou wilt assuredly go forth unto the king of Babylon's princes, then thy soul shall live, and this city shall not be burned with fire, and thou shalt live in thine house. He said, Surrender. You can't resist this man. And this is the thing that you should do. You should surrender at this particular time. Well, of course, Zedekiah did not listen, did not heed the message. Now, I read on, verse 18. But if thou wilt not go forth to the king of Babylon's princess, then shall this city be given into the hand of the Chaldeans, they shall burn it with fire, and thou shalt not escape out of their hand. And Zedekiah the king said unto Jeremiah, I am afraid of the Jews that are fallen to the Chaldeans, lest they deliver me into their hand, and they mock me. But Jeremiah said, They shall not deliver thee. Obey, I beseech thee, the voice of the Lord. You see, this man Zedekiah was so involved, because he was a coward at heart, in trying to make peace with everybody and please everybody. He was a typical politician, and as a result, he pleased nobody. And he's now got his nation in a great deal of difficulty. Now he says, verse 21, If thou refuse to go forth, this is the word that the Lord hath showed me. And behold, all the women that are left in the king of Judah's house shall be brought forth to the king of Babylon's princess, and those women shall say, Thy friends have set thee on, and have prevailed against thee. Thy feet are sunk in the mire, and they are turned away back. And this is a very interesting picture, and I won't have time to develop it, but if you would go through here, you would find out that womanhood at this time was pretty much corrupt. And as a result, when womanhood becomes corrupt in any nation, there's very little hope for it on a moral plane. And that is exactly, of course, what you have here. But now this is the message that he gives. And the message is not heeded. This man Zedekiah would not listen to Jeremiah. He still listened to the false prophets. Now, verse 28 of chapter 38. So Jeremiah abode in the court of the prison until the day that Jerusalem was taken, and he was there when Jerusalem was taken. Now, you see, this is largely historical through here, what really took place. Now, in chapter 39, what we have here is the awful thing that happened. And we are told, and I'm reading now verse 1 of chapter 39, "...in the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army against Jerusalem, and they besieged it. And in the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the fourth month, the ninth day of the month, the city was broken up." That's important to note. Now I drop down to verse 7. Moreover, he put out Zedekiah's eyes and bound him with chains to carry him to Babylon. We have that statement made, and there are two great 
truths that are self-evident up to this point. Now, Jerusalem has fallen, and Babylon now has taken it, and the city is destroyed, and the temple is burned. Now, if you want the record of that, if you went over to the 52nd chapter of Jeremiah, that's the last chapter, this is sort of a retrospect. It looks back to what took place, and this evidently was impressed upon the mind of Jeremiah. It says here, verse 4, "...it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month of the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, he and all his army against Jerusalem, and pitched against it, built forts against it. So the city was besieged until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah." You see, he had come really three times against Jerusalem. He took it the first time, and he just put Jehoiachin. Then the second time he came, and Jehoiachin had rebelled. Then he put this man Zedekiah on the throne. He was an uncle, but a young man. But he rebelled, and now he's come for the last time. And he is destroying the city of Jerusalem. And you have the record here in this chapter, which I'm not going to read, but it's a very horrible picture of how he took the city and he carried away captives, certain of the poor of the people and the residue of the people that remained in the city, those that fell away and fell to the king of Babylon and the rest of the multitude. Now, some went over to the king of Babylon, and he carried away a great delegation at this time. But the thing that he did here, and it was a thing that is very terrible, he put out Zedekiah's eyes. First of all, he slew the sons of Zedekiah before him. Verse 6 of chapter 39, "...then the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah in Riblah, Before his eyes also the king of Babylon slew all the nobles of Judah. Verse 7, Moreover, he put out Zedekiah's eyes, bound him with chains to carry him to Babylon. That's a frightful picture now that we have here. And this begins what our Lord Jesus called the times of the Gentiles. Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And I insist that though they have the city today, that they are not trodding the old city, that the Gentiles are still actually in control. Most of the holy places there, Israel doesn't have a one of them, except a wailing wall. They've got a wall to go to and weep, and that's all they've got in the old city. But the words of the Lord Jesus are still true. Now the other thing is something that's difficult for this generation to accept. And that is the fact of the judgment of God, that the judgment of God comes upon a nation, it comes upon a family, it comes upon an individual. And for 40 years, Jeremiah had proclaimed the word of Jehovah. He had denounced the sins of the people. He called these people to repentance. And they had not. And God was patient, and his patience deceived them. It enabled the false prophets to say, See, the words of Jeremiah have not come to pass. Now they have come to pass, and it's too late now. You remember, because that judgment against an evil work is not executed speedily, the heart of the sons of man is in them to do evil. Because God doesn't move hurriedly. Now, I used to think as a boy, and when I was a boy, I was a good boy, but always got with bad boys. That was my problem. And we used to steal peaches and apples and eggs and watermelons, anything else we could. And I know that one time that I was up in a peach tree, and my, those peaches were nice. And the owner of it, I heard him call my name. And... And I looked down, and there he was looking up at me. And you know, I felt at that moment that fire would come out of heaven, and God would strike me with a lightning bolt. And after that, every time 
Remember one time in a watermelon patch, couldn't get through the fence. I got hung up on a bob wire, and I thought somebody was after me, but there wasn't. It was just a bad conscience. But I felt like any moment that there would come a lightning bolt and just end it all as far as I was concerned, you see. And a great many people today think that because God doesn't move immediately, that means that he's being generous with you. It means that he's not going to do anything. You know, there's an old proverb, uh, at least one of the, I guess it was one of the Greek poets that said it, the mills of God grind slowly, (laughs) but they grind exceeding small. And God does let a people go on and on and an individual until there comes a time there is no remedy. That's where we come here. And the day that this man Nebuchadnezzar broke into the city, it says here, as we have seen, that he besieged it. And that that day, the ninth month, the city was broken up. From that moment on, it's too late. Now, it's difficult for man to accept that today that God judges. And I want to spend just a moment with this, because some of you are really going to think I'm a square, because this is outmoded today. But I want you to notice a few things and see how outmoded this is. Humanity. Mankind does not like to hear that God is going to judge. And they just can't believe that God ever gets angry. And you find that everywhere. Let me say this. You find it in the New Testament. Now, there are those today that say the God of the Old Testament, he was a God of wrath. But when you come to the New Testament, well, it's altogether different. May I say to you that there's more divine wrath and anger in the New Testament than there is in the Old? Read the 23rd chapter of the Gospel of Matthew and listen to the gentle Jesus speak. And that's what makes it frightful when he says, "'Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites!' And when you read the book of Revelation and the bowls of wrath, are poured out, and there's nothing like that in the Old Testament. So that when you say today that the Old Testament has the God of wrath, the New Testament the God of love, it's almost the other way around. But it just happens to be that he's a God of love, and he's a God also of wrath and of anger, and that he punishes sin. And you find here the thing we've mentioned before, the bitter and the sweet, you find divine judgment down by the very side of divine mercy and the throne of God today. There's a throne of grace and a place to find mercy and help. But that very throne is going to judge this earth someday, and that's what makes it extremely difficult for man to see and understand. Now, The very interesting thing is, not only is it in the New Testament, but you'll find that that is true in nature. Have you ever stopped to think today that you find the anger and judgment of God in nature? Well, if you don't believe it, then I would suggest that you go up to Yosemite Valley And there's a place called El Capitan, the sheer surface of a rock, several thousand feet high, and step off of it and see what happens. In nature, there are certain laws, and they're inexorable. And my friend, if you obey them and you're good, well, may I say to you that you'll live. But I want to say this to you, if you break them, you're going to die. The man that went to the moon, we think it's such a wonderful feat. It was. But you know what actually happened? They just were using the laws of God, and you know what they were doing? They were obeying them. They didn't break them. They didn't dare break them. When they started out to the moon, they didn't start toward the moon. They start to where it would be when they got there. And they knew it would be there. It wasn't there at the time 
but they know it would be there because that's one of the laws of God. There's movement in this universe, and it follows a certain law and a pattern. And if you ignore it, those fellows would still be out under somewhere in space, and they would not be alive. And also, when they got on the moon, they didn't say, well, now let's take off our helmets and run around here and have a lot of fun. <laughs> they didn't dare do that. They had to recognize that the law of gravity was different there and there was not any air there. And you better obey those laws. If you obey them, you'll live. If you disobey them, you'll die. Who says that? God says that. God is a God of love. And this is where he said, I've loved you with an everlasting love, but you're judged now because you've disobeyed the anger of God and the judgment of God. You don't like it? Then step off of a ten-story building that man makes, and you'll find out God has the law of gravitation working there. And he won't revoke it. He won't repeal it. He won't dissolve it to please you. May I say to you, you'll find it's there. Then may I say to you that you not only find this is a revelation of God in nature and that nature proclaims his vengeance, his anger, and his punishment, but you're also going to find it in human history. Human history does that. All you have to do is walk down through the corridor of time and look at the debris and the ashes and the wreckage of the great civilizations of this world. They testify that he's a God of vengeance, a God of punishment, a God of judgment. And when they turn from high ideals and from a lofty moral plane to base ideals, they go down and they pass off the stage of human history. And it's time some of our intellectuals in this country are beginning to read history aright today, and that God moves in human history. Now, I want to say that I feel like a square <laughs> saying this, but may I also say to you, I don't feel so bad about it, because Jeremiah was a square and the king was pig-headed. Old Zedekiah was pig-headed. And the intellectuals at that day, the sophisticates, the one who thought they knew it all, the ones who had ruled God out, they were stupid. They were stupid, my beloved. So when today I'm called an intellectual obscurantist, I don't know what that is, but whatever it is, it must not be good, and that's what they call me, may I say to you, I don't mind being that because I'm fine. I'm in very good company. The fact of the matter is, I find out God is in this area. Until next time, may God bless you, my beloved. Now, this man Jeremiah, who's been giving these prophecies, had also sent a prophecy down to Nebuchadnezzar. And as we saw back in the book of Jeremiah, he had made a trip down there himself. Now we read in verse 11 of chapter 39, Now Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, gave charge concerning Jeremiah to Nebuchadnezzar Adan, the captain of the guards, saying, Take him and look well to him and do him no harm, but do unto him even as he shall say unto thee. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was particularly good to this man, Jeremiah. It's quite interesting. He got worse treatment at the hands of his own people than he did at the hands of his enemy. And today, I have found out that I'm hurt more by those who profess to be Christian than by the unsaved world. I find this is a great principle. And I think probably many of you will agree with that. Now, Nebuchadnezzar has permitted Jeremiah to do what he wants to. He tells him here, you can come with the captives to Babylon if you want to. And Jeremiah, it's interesting enough, did not want to do that. I think he would have been given special privilege, but he did not want to see his brethren suffer as they did there by the canals of Babylon, by the rivers of Babylon, where they sat down 
where they hung up their harps and they wept when they remembered Zion. And Jeremiah did not want to go with them. They've rejected his message, and they've rejected him. And God now has raised up another prophet that will speak to them down there. It'll be Ezekiel that we'll see later on. But now he chooses to remain in the land with the poor that remain there. Who really loved that land? It was Jeremiah. Who really was patriotic? It was Jeremiah. Who really had the best interests of the people at heart? It was Jeremiah. Now, that is all quite obvious now. Now, I think that I'd like to conclude chapter 39 by reading to you a statement from another. And this is something that's very pertinent for this hour in which we are living. The thing that we said is all important is to understand that God judges and that the one who judges is a God of love. He's loved you with an everlasting love. And that makes the judgment that much worse because of the fact that he's not a tyrant and he has to do it. He has to do it in love. And the one who pronounced that harsh judgment over Jerusalem is the one who wept over Jerusalem and said, how many times would I have gathered together your little ones like a mother hen gathers her little chicks? But you would not. Now, I'd like to quote this because we have seen that the judgment of God and the anger of God is revealed in nature and it's revealed in history. It's revealed in the Old Testament and it's revealed in the New Testament. Now, I'm reading a quotation from Dr. G. Camel Morgan. Will you listen very carefully? Prisons are in the interest of the free. Hell is the safeguard of heaven. A state that cannot punish crime is doomed, and a God who tolerates evil is not good. Deny me my biblical revelation of the anger of God, and I'm insecure in the universe. But reveal to me this throne established, occupied by one whose heart is full of tenderness, whose bowels yearn with love, then am I assured that he will not tolerate that which blights and blasts and damns, but will destroy it and all its instruments in the interest of that which is high and noble and pure. And that's a tremendous statement. And we can say, thank God that he destroyed Jerusalem when he did. It revealed that he loved them, my friend, because had he been a disinterested party, he would have let them sunk lower and lower down into the depths of hell. But God won't do that. Therefore, we can look around us today, and we are seeing a nation departing farther and farther from God. And we have discovered that when crime is not dealt with, and when criminals are not punished, that we curb the liberty of folk. I must say, because there are judges today that have not handed down the sentence they should against criminals, I'd have to be careful about walking the streets as you do. I have to be careful about where I go. I have had to put more protection about my house and my neighbors, they live in fear also, and several of them have had their homes broken into. I say to you today that our liberty has been curbed, and we're talking today about freedom and liberty, and I say, let's enforce the law so we can all have liberty. That is the thing that is hard to get through. Even the PhDs, heads that are the brain trusts that are advising a government, and it's the thing that's got us in the mess that we're in today. We're so far from God. This is a tremendous section. 